Let's talk about some 1970s technological science fiction thrillers. The subscribers seem to like them. I like them. And Umbrella Entertainment, who sent me a few movies, like them as well. Let's talk about that. Umbrella has sent me one of their retro sci-fi double features. I'm not fond of the term sci-fi. But this one's got a couple of interesting movies in it. The first one is, so there it is, we've got the Andromeda Strain and we've got the Ground Star Conspiracy. Both 1970s technological thrillers. This one more famous than this one, but I like this one better. So let's talk about it. Universal Studios throughout the 1960s and 1970s produced a lot of B pictures which sat somewhere between their big budget prestige movies and the television series output that they were doing at the time like all the other major studios. The Ground Star Conspiracy sits very neatly in between those two things. It's very loosely adapted from a novel by British writer L.P. Davies and it has a lot going for it. And it does say a few things about surveillance technology, about the paranoia of intelligence agencies, and about how the Cold War was perceived at the time. After an explosion at a space research centre, a man is found with his face destroyed and a computer tape with the centre's secrets in his possession. After extensive reconstructive surgery, he's thought to be a man called John Wells, one of the scientists who worked in the research centre, Ground Star. He's told that the explosion has destroyed his memory. You can't remember a thing about who he is. Now, he's played by Michael Saracen, an actor who made a few good movies. He was great in a little thriller Joseph Stefano did in 1968 called The Eye of the Cat with Gail Honeycutt and Eleanor Parker and in a television event movie in 1973 called Frankenstein, The True Story, which you should check out. It's a little bit self-conscious, but that one's worth finding and, and worth getting a copy of. After the explosion, John Wells staggers into the house of a recently divorced woman, Nicole Devon, played by Christine Belford. This brings him under the scrutiny of a government troubleshooter called Tuxen, played by George Papad. This is George Papad at the stage of his career where he's in between playing romantic leads and playing kind of anti-heroes and bad guys. It's right at that pointy bit, which makes it interesting if you're a follower of the man's career. I've never seen him before. Oh, you saw him last night. He came to your house. This is the man? You don't recognize him? He had no face. He was nothing but blood. He could have been anything. He, he could have been from outer space. <laughs> That's what you thought, that he was from outer space. Tuxen is an absolute bastard. He's ruthless, he's driven, he's cunning. He's suspicious of everyone and everything. And he's two steps ahead of the people he's surveilling and questioning. So the questions arrive. Who's the other person Wells was working with? Is Wells actually Wells or one of the other scientists? Or is he someone else entirely? Now, inevitably, Wells and Nicole form a relationship and get together while they're trying to puzzle out who he is and, and what happened. And Tuxen is very interested to see if Nicole is already involved and whether she is a true innocent or whether she's a part of the intelligence apparatus working there. And we get to see the lengths to which Tuxen goes to to uncover the true villains behind the sabotage and to make sure and, and to eliminate other suspects. Isn't there any privacy for anybody? To hell with privacy. Murders are planned in privacy. Sabotage, revolutions, they all begin in privacy. I'd put my own family, anyone, in a spotlight naked to protect this country. Now this is a tight little thriller, I like it. All of the actors were contract players for the studio and the director Lamont Johnson was a former actor turned director who was mostly known for helming television episodes. Now those of us who are total television series geeks know that George Papad and Christine Belford worked together around the same time this movie was made in 1973 on the second season of Papad's groovy TV series Banachek. And it's interesting here because they have a smooth antagonistic rapport that really does work. And they do get some very meaty scenes between them. 
Now, Michael Sarazen is more low-key here, but the death of his father during the filming of the movie may have contributed to that. Nobody's at their best at times like that. The supporting cast in this one is full of familiar faces. Tim O'Connor, James Olsen from The Andromeda Strain, Cliff Potts and Alan Oppenheimer, who later played Rudy Wells in Six Million Dollar Man for a few scenes. We also get an actor that I always liked, a guy called James McGeechan, who played a very unshaft like black private eye in a forgotten but laudable one season TV series in the 1970s called Tenafly. The Grand Star Conspiracy was shot in Vancouver, Canada, so it didn't have the same two familiar locations that we get in Southern California based movies. And the locations are well chosen too. You get a 1970s brutalist corporate architecture for the intelligence headquarters. You get some really interestingly weathered commercial wharves and windswept shorelines and holiday homes in the woods. The movie looks a lot better than many of these kinds of movies of the time. I really do like the locations and the set designs that we get in this one. Now, overall, it's an honest technological thriller which doesn't break any new ground, but it raises some interesting questions about those surveillance technologies, about nationalism, and where the line should be drawn in intelligence matters. This is something that America was really focused on at the time. It was the time of the Watergate break-ins and Nixon's impeachment. And the questioning of exactly what privacy should be in a society and when and where that privacy should be breached were very much in the news at the time and very much in the forefront of political discussions at the time. And with the Ground Star Conspiracy, let's give a shout out to the poster art too. They don't make film posters like this anymore and I love the artwork and I love the design. It sells the movie without over promising on it. It really does give us something interesting and I remember seeing the Ground Star Conspiracy in the theatre when it first came out and I liked it. It didn't hit me over the head like other movies I saw at the time. This was around the time I saw The Wicker Man for the first time. But it does give us a good, honest little straight through thriller which asks some questions and gives us some unsettling answers. That brings us to the larger of the two films, The Andromeda Strain. Now, The Andromeda Strain was directed by Robert Wise. It was based on a novel by Michael Crichton, and it was one of the first works by Crichton that was made into a film. I have to make a confession here. I'm not a fan of either Robert Wise or Michael Crichton. Michael Crichton was one of those writers who cribbed ideas from better science fiction writers. He then put them into an airport bookshop form of page-turning middle-of-the-road fiction. He did it his entire career. If it wasn't for Spielberg and everyone's love of dinosaurs, he'd be a footnote in movie history. Robert Wise I never liked either. A lot of people liked him for a lot of the films he did, but I remember him best as the man who cut Orson Welles' second movie, The Magnificent Ambersons, while Orson was making documentaries in South America and stooping Brazilian women. Wise butchered the film so much that as I record this, People are trying to repair the Magnificent Ambersons using available footage and computer-generated inserts for the reconstructions. That in itself is enough for me not to like Robert Wise. I'm very picky with these things and I, I kind of can't forgive people for things that happened 80 years ago. But let's get back to the Andromeda strain. An American space probe returns to Earth with a sample of space dust that lands in the tiny New Mexico town of Piedmont where something inside the space probe kills everybody ex except for an old man and a baby. A four scientist team is rushed to a secret subterranean biological research lab called Wildfire, where they investigate the Andromeda strain and try to find a cure for a pathogen that seems to turn human blood into bar salts. The entire system, five quarts of blood turned to powder. Now the cast is, is fairly prosaic for the most part. Arthur Hill plays Dr. Jeremy Stone, the creator and head of Wildfire. He recruits David Wayne's character, Dr. Charles Dutton. Not to be mistaken for the character actor, Charles Dutton. They look totally different. We get a slightly sleazy Dr. Mark Hall, played by James Olsen. And best of all, you get a grumpy, chain-smoking female scientist, Dr. Ruth Levitt, played by Kate Reed. Now, it's easy to make comparisons between this movie and John Sturgis's 1965 film, The Satan Bug. Both have secret government biological warfare bases, but Sturgis's movie is more dynamic and less involved in the technology and the science than making a good 
a solid adventure movie, but it has something that the Andromeda Strain lacks. Real interesting characters. There's a lot of innovative 1970s technology in the Andromeda Strain to give it its full due. You have computerized tracking of staff around the base, you have capacitive touch screens, you have automated microscopes, a primitive version of Google or Alexa, beautifully chunky low res green screen CRT monitors. Unfortunately, do get some animal experimentation, though in reality, the animals were just knocked out with carbon dioxide and revived after each shot. But and you also get some of that really groovy 1970s technological design. The wildfire base is all stainless steel and plastic in the best possible way. It's kind of soulless and bleak, but it's also colourful and interesting. The movie also respects science in a way that subsequent science fiction movies often didn't. That makes the movie beloved by a lot of people who were scientists or later became scientists after watching the movie. But I've got a few caveats and here are the things I didn't like in this film and I think would have improved it immensely. The use of montage in this is really clumsy. Norman Jewison did this brilliantly three years before in a Thomas Crown Affair. In the Andromeda Strain, it's used when the scientists in their hazmat suits are exploring Piedmont and it cross cuts between the guys in the suits and the dead bodies of the townspeople. For me, it really lowered the emotional impact of finding a town full of corpses. It distanced me from it a lot more than it should have. Montage is a very specific thing and it should be used for very specific purposes in movies and I think that this diminishes the horror of having an entire town full of people killed by something unknown. Montage is best used for kinetic shots in films and the Thomas Crown Affair shows that. The polo playing scene in the Thomas Crown Affair and the bank heist, both of them show the full possibility of this kind of montage. The Andromeda Strain knows that it's a groovy thing to use, but doesn't know why they should use it. The second issue I've got in this are the characters. Unlike the Grand Star Conspiracy, which has really interesting characters, in the Andromeda Strain there aren't any characters apart from Kate Reed's Levitt and a lab assistant called Karen, played by Paula Kelly. The movie makes a mistake of picking low energy actors like Arthur Hill and James Olsen for two of the major roles. David Wayne, who had a long career on stage and screen, isn't given a lot to do here, but he could have done a lot more with what he had. Kate Reed's Ruth Levitt is the most valuable player in this one. And the character was originally a man in the original novel, but they decided they needed to have a woman in there, so they made her a woman. And Robert Wise's original idea was that she was going to be a very much a secondary character and a sexy scientist a la Raquel Welsh in Fantastic Voyage. That was Robert Wise's brain fart of an idea for the movie. The screenwriter Nelson Gidding talked him out of it by introducing him to a bunch of female scientists. And so they didn't make the character a really dumb, beautiful woman. Instead they make her a sardonic, chunky, middle-aged woman who chain smokes. Seen from a modern point of view, it, 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 the possibility exists that Ruth Levitt is a lesbian. The scenes with her lab technician before she's recruited for wildfire would support that conjecture. There's a certain rapport between her and her female lab assistant and co-worker that have a lot more emotional resonance than anything else in the movie. The second last problem I have with the movie is the ending. The deus ex machina ending. The alien virus mutates into a harmless form. And for me, and because I know so many writers, I know this is kind of lazy and cowardly writing. Now the last problem is right at the start of the movie. Dr. Stone is sitting before a Senate committee that is investigating the events that occurred in wildfire during the Andromeda event. So any suspense in the film is wasted right off the mark. We know that the existential threat to the human race is a fizzer. There is still a US Congress. And we know that Dr. Stone at least survives. We know that the politicians are looking for the reasons why things went wrong. But that's those scenes at the start. So we know that Dr. Stone survives. We know that it's not the end of the world. And we know that 1970s teletype machines were error prone. This is an incredibly stupid move. Imagine for a moment if Armageddon, Deep Impact or Avengers Endgame started off with a committee questioning the protagonists about what actually happened. 
it really just dissipates any suspense in the film. But having said that, a lot of people like it. It's got points of interest. It's got that groovy 1970s technology that's kind of retro, but interesting to us. And although there is a Criterion edition of the Andromeda Strain, my recommendation is this. I'd rather spend my Criterion money on a more worthy film. Get the Criterion edition of Haskell Wexler's Medium Cool, or The Man Who Fell to Earth, or or some other film like that if you're into science fiction. Find one of the other Criterion science fiction films and get that one. My advice is get the Andromeda Strain on this bare bones umbrella edition and you'll get the Ground Star Conspiracy as a pleasant little edition. It's nicely packaged. Like I said, there are no extras in this one. But that's okay. The movies are well transferred. It's not an expensive set, and you can get the other, this is the fifth volume, and you can get the others as well, and have the set. They're doing some really interesting choices in these films, and I hope they continue to do so in the future. Umbrella sent me this movie, so even though they're not a sponsor of the channel, I got the movie for review. I got the discs for review, sorry. And I like them. I like the package. I like the fact that they recognize that, like the ground star conspiracy at its heart the andromeda strain is a big picture it's got certain things going for it but again it's not universal putting their a game into it uh it's well respected by a lot of people but there were things that took me out of the movie much more than there were things that drew me into it and that's a little bit of a shame because i was looking forward to re-watching it but ultimately, it was just that little bit disappointing. Whereas The Ground Star Conspiracy, I liked a lot. I liked the acting in it. I liked the actors. Uh, there's some good, crisp action scenes in it. And I always liked George Papad movies. So there's that to going as well. For the next review, I've got a nice little umbrella release in their Beyond Genres series. A little film called The Love Witch, which is just a beautifully fun dark comedy and i'm look look and i'm looking forward to telling you about that next time around so anyway thank you very much for watching if you enjoyed the video please like subscribe and leave a comment let me know what you think about these two particularly the andromeda strain because i know there are a lot of people who think it's the best thing since sliced bread but for me it wasn't and i'm happy to have a discussion in the um, comments about the virtues of people seeing that film but for me it just didn't hit the mark and by the way you can also support the channel and support my addiction to reviewing these films by donating as little as a one dollar american per month at patreon.com slash paleo cinema um it's been a pretty hard week for me to be honest with you there's been some kind of personal stuff i've been dealing with in the family that's been a little difficult so i'm glad i got this review out and i'm glad i watched these two movies as a distraction from that but anyway in the meantime before the next video comes out watch some good movies watch some bad movies and i'll catch you next time